Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this last lecture on structural dynamics. Today we're talking about non-proportional damping and complex mode shapes. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to do some uh, introductions on what damping is and the different types of damping that are out there in the classical sense. And then once we've done that, we're going to dive right into non-classical or non-proportional damping and the concepts of complex mode shapes. So damping is developed through the contribution of intrinsic and interfacial mechanisms between materials. So you can think of damping as the complex molecular interactions that happen within materials. Um, so let's write that down. So this is a complex molecular interactions. That's basically uh, molecules and their interactions and the frictions that exist in between them. And the second form of damping and friction we have are typically referred to as interfacial damping. And uh, it's whenever you have uh, friction between two different materials um, so let's write that down as well. So that's the second type. And if you recall from high school physics, uh, whenever we uh, talked about damping, we always had some sort of mass, and this mass had a normal force. Uh, subjected to it and there was like a substrate underneath this mass and uh, we introduced the concept of friction coefficient uh, which multiplied together with the normal force to give us the friction force so we had ff force of friction is equal to the friction coefficient multiplied by the normal force and this was uh, from high school and as it turns out this kind of uh, friction or damping is actually very common in the real world and in fact it's typically referred to as Coulomb friction. So let's write it down. <clears throat> so we have Coulomb friction. Now this is one of the very common ways damping is uh, thought of and the way it works is as follows. Whenever an object moves, it can have, um, in a two-dimensional sense, it can have a positive velocity or a negative velocity. And so whenever you have a velocity versus the damping force, uh, Coulomb friction works in the following way. Whenever you have positive velocity, you get a positive constant force. And whenever you have negative velocity, because the magnitude of the velocity is negative, you get a negative force. And this can be represented in the following uh, way, in the following equation. We have uh, some sort of uh, Coulomb coefficient, and uh, we're interested in the sign of the velocity term, so u dot. Now, as you can see, this is a discontinuous or a nonlinear function. And as you may imagine, this is very hard to model anytime you have uh, several degrees of freedom or you have a very sophisticated uh, structural system. This is very hard to model. So what we do is to introduce an alternative, and that alternative is called viscous damping. And viscous damping is very easy to model because, first of all, it's linear. And what I'd like to do now is to draw the plot, the, the force plot for the viscous damping. And this is what it looks like. So again, we're interested in uh, the damping force versus velocity. In general, damping is always a function of velocity. It can be functions of displacement or acceleration, but velocity is always a main contributor. It's just uh, how the physics of uh, damping works. And so we get a linear line that looks kind of like that. 
okay? And um, the equation for viscous damping is represented the following way. We have Fd is equal to damping coefficient multiplied by velocity. And this is really what we've been seeing in our equations of motion so far in these lecture series. And um, you may be wondering, okay, so the question is, which of these two, so we have one and two, is more realistic? The answer is that damping in reality is a combination of the two. So uh, one example of a more realistic damping would be something like this. So let's do one more figure. All right, so it's going to look something like this. Uh, you can have um, a very sharp increase in the damping force, and then some sort of slippage, and then you get into the viscous phase. And uh, the same thing is also going to be mirrored in the negative direction. So we can have a sharp increase, and some sort of slippage, and then the viscous phase. And this is what we tend to see in nature as a more realistic way of thinking about damping. Okay, now one of the things that we discussed in this course uh, was the concept of modal damping. And modal damping works by assigning individual damping ratios to each of the modes. So what we did, for example, was to create a modal damping matrix, which was equal to two, the modal mass matrix, our resonant frequencies, our natural frequencies, and the zetas. So the zeta for the individual natural frequency. And what we ended up getting was a diagonal matrix that, was, uh, that looked like this. So we have C1, C2, and it goes on until however many degrees of freedom we have. And all these other elements are zeros. Modal damping is the first uh, sort of uh, me uh, topic or method in the field of classical damping. And uh, just to remember how things worked, uh, we also have to take this modal damping uh, matrix and convert it back to the general vectors uh, and that is done through the following way. So we have the general damping matrix phi, phi being the mode shape, transposed, inverse, uh, we plugged in the uh, modal damping matrix and then did phi inverse. So let's do a quick example involving a single degree of freedom system just to remember how things worked. Example, <clears throat> if I have a single degree of freedom system, oopsies, uh, something like this with a column, and I have a K value of 100 and a mass value of 10, and I'm trying to explore the different values of zeta. Um, let's say we have 0 0.01, we have 0 0.1, we have 0.25, we have 0.6, and we have 1.0. The way we uh, obtained the um, modal damping coefficient was through the following way. We have C is equal to 2m omega n zeta. And in this case, omega n is equal to square root of k over m because this is an SDOF system and so we have 100 divided by 10 uh, square root of that is 3.16 radians per second and so what I want to do now is to open up MATLAB and write a script and what I'd like to show you is how the uh, this degree of freedom u behaves in reference to some sort of input force PT. And to really show you that um, what the effect of the damping ratio is on the amplification of the force in the output displacement at the harmonic or at the natural frequencies. So let's see. Uh, 
um, I'm opening my MATLAB script here and what I have here is uh, all my parameters I have different values for zeta and I have this loop here that uh, goes around and uh, uh, simulates a system uh, for different zeta values and so we'll, we'll go ahead and compile this okay this is what we have so uh, first of all we're gonna focus on this top plot here this top plot is the amplitude response so if you are thinking in terms of input force output displacement uh, we're looking at uh, the gain between the input and the output here in this amplitude plot in the horizontal axis we have the frequencies and we can see that at a single frequency of uh, roughly 3.16 uh, roughly here in this vertical line is where we have the most amplification that has to do with resonance uh, Again resonance is when the inertial term and the stiffness terms cancel each other out and Whenever zeta is quite small like zeta is equal to 0.01 We see a lot of amplification here and when zeta is increased we have more damping and damping is able to take care of uh, the force in the absence of stiffness and inertial terms because they've canceled each other out and so as we increase the uh, damping we get less uh, amplification in the output so we get a smaller displacement so you can think of damping as a means to reduce your uh, displacements your deformations that's why in cars uh, and in buildings we uh, use dampers your cars have dampers so you feel less of the uh, bumpiness on the road and in buildings we put dampers so they absorb a lot of the uh, shock waves that enter buildings uh, from earthquakes and so forth and so that's what we have now in the engineering field and practice a lot of people thought that well uh, this may be a little inconvenient this kind of um, this kind of uh, approach towards damping so um, another method was introduced uh, which is typically referred to as proportional damping or Rayleigh damping and we're gonna write that down here so let's see got Rayleigh or proportional damping So what is proportional damping? Proportional damping is a much more convenient way of uh, reproducing the damping matrix for practical purposes. Uh, the way it works is um, it says that um, the damping matrix is equal to some kind of constant A0 multiplied by the mass matrix plus a second constant A1 multiplied by the stiffness matrix. So we're saying that the damping matrix is proportional to the mass matrix and it's also proportional to the stiffness matrix. In fact, it's a linear combination of those two matrices. And so where uh, for some appropriate damping ratio, zeta, so for some selection of zeta one and zeta two, um, each of these are allocated to a specific uh, resonant frequency we are able to obtain uh, the constant A1 and A0 and I'll explain in a couple minutes um, how this method works so zeta1 is uh, dedicated to one of the resonant frequencies omega i and the second one is desi designated towards omega j and uh, let's talk about let's talk about mass uh, proportional damping. So sometimes, like in the concept of uh, like in the uh, earlier discussion about modal damping, we had a damping matrix is equal to some sort of constant multiplied by the mass. So we call that uh, mass proportional damping. Whenever we have mass proportional damping, 
we ended up getting a relationship between zeta and the constant a naught um, through the following way. So we had zeta n, which is equal to c over 2 mass omega n. So what I want to do here is to get rid of the c and the, uh, the mass matrix and to introduce a naught. 2 omega n. And this is the kind of relationship we get between zeta and a naught for a mass proportional system. And in this case, the natural frequency ends up in the denominator. So there is kind of an inverse relationship between the natural frequency and the zeta parameter. Now, as it turns out, for stiffness proportional systems, or stiffness proportional dampings, zeta n is equal to a1 over 2 omega n. So there is a, almost a, um, a direct relationship between the natural frequency. As that increases, the, res the uh, zeta parameter increases as well. So now I want to draw a figure that demonstrates these two relationships, this mass proportional concept and the stiffness proportional concept, and put these two uh, together and uh, allow us to look at the grand scheme of things, uh, which is this equation up here, this uh, Rayleigh uh, damping concept. All right, so let's go to a new page and let's draw us a figure. This is what we have. Here it is. And I'm going to draw two lines to begin with. This is my first line. And this is my second line. In the vertical axis, I'm going to put zeta, which is damping ratio for the uh, mode n. So we can have n many modes. To begin with, we have modes 1, 2, and we can go up to n. And at the same time, we have in the, ver in the horizontal axis, we have omega 1, omega 2, so we have omega n's. And we can go up to omega capital N, that's what we have. And um, this first line here is representative of the mass uh, proportional damping. So when we're thinking about uh, the concept of stiffness proportional damping, we get the second line. So we have stiffness proportional and we get mass proportional. So scientists have run uh, experiments and um, it turns out that in reality we get a combination of these two. So we get something uh, along these two lines and there's a transition zone where the line goes to the stiffness uh, proportional um, location. So um, this is the kind of, in red is uh, the kind of relationship that the Rayleigh damping suggests and it's backed up by real research and uh, real evidence. So this is Rayleigh damping. And the way the Rayleigh damping works is uh, we have um, this uh, zeta n parameter, which is the damping ratio, and it equals a naught over 2 omega n plus a1 omega n divided by 2. So um, this involves, this equation involves two unknown parameters, a naught and a1. So what we want to do is to uh, say that um, we know the damping ratio at two of these uh, natural frequencies. I want to say omega 1. I can also say, I don't know, omega 4. And so once I know, once I know the answer at two of these locations, then I'm able to predict and estimate what the values are 
for a naught and a one. So we have two unknowns. We need two equations that involves knowing two natural frequencies. So to do that, we have uh, the following matrix relationship. We have uh, one over omega i, omega i, and one over omega j, omega j. We close this matrix up. We have a vector of our unknowns, a naught and a one, and that equals to zeta i and zeta j. Okay, and this one, for example, could be zeta i, and this one could be zeta j. So I want to do an example now involving a three degree of freedom system, and we're going to use Rayleigh damping or proportional damping, and um, we'll see how things are, uh, how things pan out. So let's do an example. In this example, I have a three-story building. Uh, first of all, I'm going to draw the columns for this building. Then I'm going to draw the floors. This is my top floor, second floor, and this is my first floor. Here it goes. And what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the mass of each floor is lumped here in the middle, just to make things really easy. Here it is. And um, for the top floor, the weight of the floor is 200 kips. Kips is a units or a measure of force, so we're thinking about weight. So we later have to convert weight to mass. Uh, we have uh, 400 kips, and we have 400 kips on the first floor. In terms of uh, the stiffness parameters, we are introducing the units kip per inch. So we have uh, 610 in the top floor, 610 in the second floor, and 610 in the first floor. And this is the kind of fixed space we have. Okay, so I, um, I write down my mass matrix because it's a matrix. I use a capital letter and I convert kips to uh, units of mass. So what I do is I take 1 over G, which is 386. That's uh, inches per second squared. That's the gravitational pull of the Earth. And I end up with a diagonal matrix here. I have 400, 400, and 200. Okay. And this is for degrees of freedom 1, 2, and uh, 3. <clears throat> And then what I do is I write my stiffness matrix. So I have 610, 2, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 2, minus 1, 0, minus 1, minus, uh, plus 1. At any time, if you're confused about the derivations of any of these, uh, just click uh, on one of the previous videos where we talked about multi-degree freedom systems. I believe uh, we did uh, two or three examples involving three-story buildings, and these derivations are uh, included in those videos. And so that's what we have, and the question is telling us to derive the Rayleigh damping matrix. So we want to do Rayleigh damping. And we are prescribed with damping ratios for mode 1 and damping ratio for mode 2 of 5%. So that's equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is to calculate my two constants for the Rayleigh relationship, that is a naught and a 1. So I go up here and I check this relationship out, this uh, matrix here. I'm going to plug my natural frequencies in there, and I'm going to get uh, a naught and a 1. As it turns out, using my mass and stiffness matrix, I have the following relationships. I have uh, omega 1 is equal to 12.57 radians per second. Omega 2 is equal to 
34.33 radians oops, per second. And lastly, I have omega-3 is equal to 46.89 radians per seconds. Okay, so we're going to construct that matrix relationship and we will be able to identify the parameters A1 and A0. So we have, um, let's see, we have uh, 1 over 12.57, 12.57. In the second row I have 1 over 34.33. So the first row was pretty much for the first uh, natural frequency and the second row is for the second natural frequency. And we're interested in identifying what A0 and A1 are. And we are told that the damping ratio for the first natural frequency is 0 0.05. And for the second one, it's the same as well. It's 5%. And this 2, if you remember, was on the left-hand side of this equation. It was 1 half. So I've moved it over to the right-hand side. And this is what we have. And as it turns out, when we solve this um, relationship, we get A0 is equal to 0 0.9198. And we get A1 is equal to 0 0.0021. And so now I can construct my damping matrix. So I have C is equal to A0 mass matrix plus A1 stiffness matrix. I plug all those in, M and K are matrices, A0 and A1 are constants, and I get the following, 3.55, minus 1.30, 0, and I get minus 1.3, 3.55, minus 1.3, Right, and that's what we have. And what I can now do is to find the relationship for zeta 3. And uh, the way we do that is to have um, um, this to make uh, take advantage of this equation. So we have a naught is over um, omega 3. And I have the following, which is um, a1 omega 3 2. So um, it turned out that omega-3 was equal to 46.89. So I plug all those parameters in, and it turns out that zeta-3 is equal to 0 0.0593. So that's 5.93%. Uh, that's what we have. All right. Now, this is the segment of the lecture that I'm going to designate towards non-proportional damping. So it's a little more advanced. And uh, um, I think it's important to uh, learn about non-proportional damping and to understand what it means. Damping. And really the reason for that is that in reality, uh, most dynamical systems tend to be non-proportionally damped. Uh, it is true that whenever we do engineering, we make a lot of idealizations, we uh, simplify things um, so that we can model in a shorter amount of time, we can be much more efficient, but you know, reality, uh, real world is always more complicated, and uh, that's how it is. So what I do now is to take my three-story building and represent it as a lollipop model. And this is my original model, original. And uh, in the original model, I had M1, M2, and M3. So what I want to do now is to take this model and copy paste it. Copy, paste. Perfect. So what I want to do now is to introduce a damper at the very first floor. And it's going to look like that. And this uh, damper has a damping coefficient of Ca. And so if I'm thinking about my damping matrix, 
for this new building, new. Um, C new is equal to C, which was the original C we obtained earlier up here. And um, this must be added with a CA zero zero and all zeros. And that CA is really the contribution of the damper that is installed on the first floor. And as it turns out, I get C nu is equal to the following. So what I want to do now is to go on MATLAB and formulate my state matrix. My state matrix is represented as such, 0i Again, if you're confused about what a state matrix is, we did a whole uh, lecture on state space systems and uh, you can view that, it's a quick lecture and uh, it's not a really tough concept, but it's very useful. And what I'm going to do is to use the command on MATLAB uh, that's going to give me the following relationships. So my phi and my uh, natural frequencies uh, squared. And that command is IG AS. We're going to do, we're going to develop this uh, state matrix for the original C and for the new C. And what I want to show you is uh, on what happens to the phi vector, which is our mode shapes. So uh, I open MATLAB and uh, I run and co uh, compile everything and I get the following. And in a second, I'm going to pull up my MATLAB script and it has a really nice figure. Uh, so we're going to get that get to that soon. Um, so we get a, for the first case, for the original case, we get a, a uh, mode shape that looks like this. The first column is for the first mode. The second column is for the second mode. And the third column is for the third mode. Now, when I do the same thing for the new system with the new added damper, turns out my modal shapes will have imaginary components to them. So the first parameter will be 0 0.5. At this time, it's going to have an imaginary component to it. I'll quickly complete this for the remainder of the values in the matrix as well. Have 1.0, 0.02, 0.05, and then I have a minus 0 0.9984. And lastly, I have a V following. I have a 0 0.499 plus 0 0.033i. And then I have minus 0 0.866 minus point zero zero ninety six I and then the last term is one so this is what we get uh, the phi's uh, now have uh, an imaginary component to them and there is a meaning behind this imaginary component, and I'll explain in just a second so what I want to do now is to pull up my MATLAB script for uh, the uh, the system here I've plugged in all my uh, parameters I'm uh, creating my mass matrix here and then I'm doing all my figures down here. So what I want to do first is to create my system, uh, my, my original system without the added damper. So let's go ahead and compile this. Okay, this is what we have. Now let's look at our first mode. We have a three-story building and the first mode looks like this. We have all the uh, degrees of freedom they are in phase, uh, 
and they're moving at the same time and the same direction. They have different amplitudes. That's our first mode, okay? And this uh, real axis is what we're seeing here uh, on the horizontal plane. Okay, so uh, in the second mode, uh, it's similar. Um, it looks like this. I'm rotating my building and I'm looking at my mode shapes. And uh, again, uh, my mode shapes are in phase. There is nothing out of phase. So if I'm looking at them uh, through the imaginary axis, they're all in phase. And uh, they're just in different directions. Uh, so this top mass, this top degree of freedom, and this bottom one have different directions, but they're again in phase. And lastly, I want to look at my third uh, degree of freedom, or excuse me, my third mode shape. And this is what I end up with. I have uh, all my degrees of freedom being in, in the same phase, uh, but they're in different directions and have different amplitudes. And so this is the concept of classical damping or proportional damping. This is what it results in. You will have uh, mode shapes that are uh, always in phase. So you don't see anything in the imaginary axis. So now what I want to do is to introduce my system with the damper and I'm going to compile it. And now we're going to look at the um, first mode. So what we're seeing is that the first mode has imaginary components shown in the red and uh, the real components shown in the blue. And um, what this means is that our um, our mode shapes have an out of phase component to them. So when the building is harmonically moving at the, uh, this particular natural frequency, so uh, <clears throat> if, if the building is moving with this kind of uh, motion, then my degrees of freedom are not going to uh, move at the same uh, frequency. Some of them uh, will be a little slower um, and will catch up um, at a different phase angle. So now I'm going to look at my second figure. Um, this is my second mode. It has, again, an imaginary component. That's what that means. And lastly, I'm looking at my third um, mode, and uh, I'm showing you the uh, imaginary components and the out-of-phase components. OK? So let's summarize what we just observed. OK, let's go down here. And to do this, um, I'm going to use my keyboard. It's a little cleaner. So we want to say, in conclusion, <clears throat> all right, so what is our first conclusion? The first conclusion is that in non-proportionally damped systems, each degree of freedom has a different phase angle. So in the non-proportionally damped systems, and non-proportionally damped systems are any kind of uh, naturally occurring systems where um, some of the damping terms are modified, like what we just observed. Or sometimes if you have buildings that are not symmetric, you can have non-proportionally damped um, systems. So in non-proportionally damped systems, comma, each degree of freedom has a different phase angle. So that's the first conclusion. And um, the second one is that in non-proportional systems, the damping matrix is not proportional to the mass and stiffness matrices. So uh, in non-proportional systems, the damping matrix is not proportional proportional to mass and stiffness matrices. And there's a very uh, quick way of checking that. I believe it's called the coffee criterion. And the way it works is uh, through the following way. We have this equation that is equal to C in inverse K, and this equals to K M inverse C. Um, when I plug my damping matrix, mass matrix, and stiffness matrices in here, and whenever they equal, it means I have proportional damping. 
And whenever they are not equal, so this is the equal case, and whenever they're not equal, it means I have a non-proportionally damped system. All right, that's uh, about it. This is the last lecture in this series. I hope you found this series useful. Uh, in the future, I'm planning on uh, creating a course, a lecture series on advanced experimental dynamics. That's my first aim uh, right after this dynamic course. And hopefully in the future, I can do something on structural damping. And um, that could be hopefully useful uh, for a lot of the people in the community uh, within civil engineering and outside. All right. Appreciate it.